Hi, hello there, welcome to my channel. If you are a new viewer or an old subscriber, I just wanna say that I am happy to have you here and I hope you're doing well. Today's video, I'm going to be talking about Ben Foster, this crazy psycho dude who went on like a rampage for six years beating women. But it's, it's a really wild story and I wanted to share it with you guys. The first time that I had ever heard about Ben Foster was around last year, I wanna say, when I was making videos on frogging incidents and crazy home intruders. So it's kind of in that realm and if you like those videos, you'll probably like this one too but if not i'll hopefully see you in the next one also disclaimer today's video is going to have subjects of abuse and domestic abuse and just violence so if that's not your cup of tea i'll see you later hopefully but if this sounds interesting to you i hope you stick around leave a like if you feel up to it and maybe subscribe if you're feeling extra generous and let's get into the video it was in june of 2012 when amber had first met ben when they were working at a las vegas day club on the strip he was a bartender and amber was a waitress need i say more he had this whole jared leto look going on and she was a very beautiful girl so obviously they hit it off quick and a friendship soon turned into a relationship and after a year of seeing each other and dating ben Ben would eventually move in with Amber. Things were on the up and up and Amber and Ben both seemed very happy in the relationship. Amber said he was kind, funny, and one of her favorite attributes was that he was very smart. The only couple of quirks Ben seemed to have were that he was introverted and reserved. He also had a huge infatuation with guns and knives and stuff of that nature, which there's nothing wrong with, but it was definitely a sign that maybe he was struggling with something and um, should have gotten help sooner. All in all, it was a very good relationship ship until because there's always an intel. Ben's true personality started to slip through the cracks, showing his more possessive and aggressive side. It's said that Ben had a very jealous personality and quite the temper where he would just blow up and be angry for a long amount of time or act out becoming aggressive and violent. One of Ben's first blow ups with Amber had stemmed around the fact that Amber was helping her foreign ex-boyfriend stay in the country while he was working on getting the proper documentation, which I would feel a little uncomfortable with as well. Like, like, I get not wanting your girlfriend or boyfriend to want to be talking to their ex. But there was nothing remotely romantic going on between Amber and her ex-boyfriend. He, in fact, had moved on and was engaged to another woman. Amber was in a hap- well- happy relationship with Ben. It was truly just her trying to be helpful. If you ask me though, it seems that Ben was projecting his insecurities onto Amber because unbeknownst to Amber, Benny Boo had a little secret he was hiding. He was continuing a relationship with his ex-girlfriend that Amber did not find out about until later. Something else I want to mention is the fact that Amber said Ben would playfully um, take this practice hunting knife and playfully pretend to slit her throat with it, which to me, um, if that is not the biggest red flag in the world, I don't know what is. Oh my god, he's just so silly. Like, girl, what? That's crazy. Things really took a turn for the worse, though, one afternoon in November 2014. After an argument between Ben and Amber, Amber decided to tell Ben that she had thrown away one of his new guns, which is probably not the smartest thing to tell someone who's in a really bad mood. I can understand her naively trying to, like, fuck around with him while he's being pissy. Is it right? No. But I don't think she meant any harm and was just trying to calm the situation by messing around with him. Ben, though, hears this and goes off, slapping Amber to the ground. Amber took off and called the police. They escorted her back home where Ben would be arrested. Although he only stayed in jail for a couple of months and was let out when the court let him attend anger management classes and community service. And it wasn't until September of 2015, almost a year later, that another incident would ensue. Amber ran home to grab a jacket while she was out with friends. It was cold. She just wanted to go grab one and then she was going to go back out and meet them. But when she pulled into the parking lot of her apartment complex, she was greeted by a volatile Ben who started to beat on her car and scream at her, telling her to get out and just going crazy. However, instead of calling the police or anyone really, she waits for Ben to leave and then goes inside. She walks into her bedroom and as she's opening her closet door, Ben storms in grabbing Amber by the hair and throwing her onto the ground. He pulls out his knife and goes to hit her in the face, but instead she puts her hand up and it slices her pinky to the bone. There's blood everywhere and Amber is thinking that this is probably the day that she's going to die. He drags her out to the garage and starts beating on her more. He gets up for a split second and Amber takes this as her last chance to be able to escape. 
She opens the garage door and crawls out. When she gets outside, she books it to the leasing office and they call the police for her. When police finally do arrive though, it wasn't Ben they were putting into handcuffs, but instead Amber. When they had questioned Ben about what happened, he flipped it around to make it seem like Amber was the aggressor. He cleaned the apartment and even roughed himself up a bit by cutting his face, saying that she attacked him with the knife, not even giving Amber time to explain herself or them doing the due diligence of looking up Ben's history because if they would have, they would have seen that not even a year ago, Ben was arrested for domestic charges against Amber. After sitting in jail for a little under 24 hours, she was able to get the judge to look into the details a little bit more, and they found out about his past attack and let her go, dropping the charges. When she got home, though, everything in her apartment had been stolen, but at least Ben was out of her life, for now anyway. In September of 2017, Ben had started talking to a girl named Jamie, who also lived in Las Vegas. They were in martial arts classes together and just kind of struck up a relationship. He was able to show Jamie his nice, compassionate side, was kind, well-mannered, and attractive in her words, not mine. It was easy to see how somebody could fall for that side of him. And it was in December of the same year he met Jamie, he would reach out to Amber, telling her how sorry he is for the way he treated her and he's working towards a better path in life. They end up going to dinner and he starts his spiel about how sorry he is and hoping that she'll forgive him. Giving him the benefit of the doubt, she opens up her life to him again, accepting him and hoping to see the change that he's gone on and on about. And it was Christmas Eve of the same year so really only a couple of weeks into all of this, Ben sitting on the couch and Amber gets up to go to the kitchen or the other room, leaving her phone on the table in the living room. When she goes back into the living room, Ben's gone up from the couch and he comes from the kitchen behind her and begins strangling her until she loses consciousness. When she eventually wakes up, she hears Ben like going through the house, tearing stuff up and punching holes in the wall. She's able to escape by jumping off of her balcony. She just keeps running until she sees a car. A lady in a car lets Amber in and they call the police. The cops this time take Amber seriously and arrest Ben with the state pressing charges on Amber's behalf. This whole time though, he's still talking to Jamie and in the next year, he ended up convincing her to let him move in because he really had nowhere else to go. Just like with Amber though, it didn't take long for things to go awry. He wasn't working or carrying his weight around her place, relying on her to do everything for him. And when she would eventually bring up the fact she can't do everything forever, it seemed to really piss him off. And one day it turned violent with Ben coming up from behind her and slamming her onto the ground for no apparent reason. He also started to believe that people were following him and out to get him. And it was in September of 2019 when things got even worse. Ben attacking Jamie so often that she would actually stay at hotels throughout the week and she couldn't get him out of her apartment. Scared that if she says anything to him or does anything, he'll go off on her. So she finally decided to file a restraining order against him, but when the cops showed up to serve him, Ben didn't answer the door, and when she asked if they could escort her inside so she could get some of her stuff, they said, no, we don't do that. There was nothing else that she could really do. She waited in the parking lot for a couple of hours, but eventually went inside and went to bed. When she woke up, Ben was hovering over her, holding her arms down and shaved her head, saying, no man will ever look at you and think you're pretty. Ben held Jamie hostage in her condo for a couple of weeks. At night, he would hold a gun to her head or tie her up, and then during the day, he just wouldn't let her outside. She wasn't allowed to have her phone. Going as far as to stripping her naked so she couldn't hide anything from him, and going on to attack her throughout the day, telling her that he was going to kill her. And it was a little over two weeks into this ordeal when she finally had an idea. She told him that they had to get groceries and dog food because there was nothing at the house at this point. She was able to convince him and they drove to the nearest convenience store. They ended up taking Maya, Jamie's dog, with them. And at the convenience store, Ben got out of the car to let Maya go to the bathroom. And seeing this may be her only chance to get away, Jamie takes off into the store, relaying everything that happened to an employee and asking if they have a room that she can call somebody in. They say no, so she runs out the back door and into an apartment complex parking lot. A man sees her frantic running around and asks her if everything's okay and if she needs a ride to the hospital. So she gets 
gets in his car and when she gets to the hospital, they see that she has multiple injuries, enough that the hospital actually ends up calling the police to report the abuse. Scared that police will only make the situation worse, she's apprehensive telling them what happened, but did eventually give a statement. And it was later that night that Jamie would be released from the hospital. And on her way home, she found out that police had gotten a search warrant for her place to see if Ben was there. And when Jamie arrived home, she saw police, news reporters, SWAT, the whole nine yards outside her house. They had tear gassed the place to try and get him out and the door was knocked down. Probably quite the scene for Jamie who's ready to just like go home and shower and sleep probably. Ben finally came out with Maya. The dog's fine, don't worry. And he was taken into custody and charged with a slew of things. Battery, domestic violence. However, Jamie did not show up to testify against him in the trial and he made a deal with the DA, pleading guilty to lesser domestic violence charges and was released in October of 2021, just 24 months after the kidnapping. And upon his release, Ben goes back to his home state of Oregon, where he meets Justine Siemens at a bar they both work at. And just like with every girl he's been with, he's able to weave his way into their life, convincing them that he's this great guy. But in reality, he's Satan, so. And after about two months into the relationship, a red flag starts waving. Ben showed up to Justine's while her best friend Angie was over and asked for clean urine so he could pass a test. Justine was smart and decided to not just brush this off and looked into his past a little bit more, knowing that if you have to take a urinalysis test, it's probably because you've gotten in trouble with the law multiple times or for serious offenses. He was able to find out about his history in Las Vegas, beating his girlfriends there, Jamie and Amber, because because if other people had found out about Ben, then it would be really bad for business knowing that there's like an abuser working at the bar and also protecting women that Ben may have preyed on at the bar. He was fired soon after and Ben knew it was Justine who had told on him and feeling uncomfortable about the whole situation, Justine stopped hanging around and talking to Ben completely. On the night of January 24th, 2023, Angie Milner, Justine's best friend, gets a phone call from her mom telling her that Justine needs needs help, saying that Justine called her and that she needed to get to a hospital and something was wrong, with the phone dying shortly after. Angie tries calling Justine multiple times but gets no answer. With little to go off of and growing concern something bad might be happening, Angie gets in her car and rushes off to Justine's house, all while calling the police telling them what's going on. Angie arrives and continues the phone call with the police updating every moment or so of the situation. She walks up to the house and tries to get in the front door but it's locked, calling out for Justine she walks around back and hears something. The sound of her friends screaming out for help. It's very coarse as if she's choking on something and continues letting out these guttural screams. Then all of a sudden she hears these loud bangs from inside the house. Angie runs back around front and this is when she notices that the garage door is open, which is something that she could have swore was not open when she first got there. She rushes inside the garage and this is when she runs into Ben. Angie asks what the hell's going on and Ben says that Justine's having a heart attack. Angie Angie asks Ben why he didn't call the police and he just tells her to go inside and get Justine and he'll bring her car around front and they can take her to the hospital. Angie, frantic, rushes inside and Ben just leaves. Angie finds Justine face down on the kitchen floor, unconscious in a pool of blood, oozes up and down her body and even a noose tied around her neck. Angie knows exactly what happened though and does not believe Ben for one minute and when the police arrive, Angie tells them that Ben was the one who did this. He had done it before to all of his ex-girlfriends in Las Vegas. After questioning, she rushes over to the hospital and finds Justine in a coma with little hope that she'll make it just because of how severe her injuries are. So while Justine is sitting in a hospital bed, Ben on the other hand is running free and wild. It turns into a nationwide manhunt. Every news station was talking about it, police warning people to not pick up hitchhikers and telling people to watch out on dating websites because he could potentially be looking for his next victim there. It was a very scary time because the guy was un hinged and unpredictable. And on January 24th, police had found out that Ben had grown up in Grants Pass, Oregon. And when they went over to question Ben's parents who still lived there, his parents had seen Ben just the night prior because he came home and started grabbing clothes and other items from the house. His parents had no clue what he had done to Justine, but they believed what the police had told them because of everything that he's done in his past. And they weren't surprised because he's changed a lot over the years and has become a lot more aggressive. They tell police that he may 
may have gone back to Las Vegas, but on January 26, police get a tip that he may be staying at a residence in the Sunny Valley area, which isn't far from Grants Pass. It's just more rural and woodsy. They set up a surveillance and catch Ben at a house belonging to a woman named Tina Jones. So while the police are outside scoping the area, like in the tree line, the dogs inside Tina's house start barking and they see Ben come out with binoculars and climb on top of the house and start looking around. He spots one of the police officers and just takes off running. Unfortunately, they do lose him by the highway, but at least they have someone they can bring in for questioning to see where he may be going. They focus on Tina and why she would be hiding Ben. And it turns out she's a family friend from the church that they all attended when he was younger. And as they're searching throughout the house, they find a bag that belonged to Ben, full of money, clothes, and electronics, and it wasn't until January 30th that they questioned Tina further. She told investigators that Ben showed up to her house because he had gotten into an argument with his parents and had nowhere else to go, not knowing what he had actually done and that police were searching for him. Tina went on to tell investigators that no one should be up at her house and Ben's probably gone and she doesn't want him there because of this newfound information and also that she's worried for her dogs. She tells police that she would trust her neighbor, Richard Barron, to go and take the dogs out and to take care of them while she's away. So police call Richard and ask him if he would be all right with taking care of Tina's dogs. He says yes. And they also tell him everything about Ben and to just keep his eyes open and to let them know if he sees anything weird going on. On January 31st, police get a call from a taxi service with the driver saying that someone by the name of Richard Barron had asked for a ride out of the Sunny Valley area. However, declined it because the man that was on the phone sounded too young to be Richard, which is an amazing detail for someone to pick up on. The driver tells police about his concerns and how it could possibly be Ben, knowing about the manhunt, and police head over to see if it could have been Ben. When they arrive at Richard's house, they go in and they find that Richard had been murdered in his home alongside his caretaker, Richard Griffith. However, now it wasn't just a domestic abuse case, but a full-on murder investigation, which really amped things up. Police called around to local cab and taxi companies to see if anyone may have picked him up from the area, and they were able to find a driver saying that someone by the name of Richard Barron had called. They showed the driver a picture of Ben and they said that that's him. That's the man that they picked up and how Ben also had a dog with him, which is absolutely terrifying to think about in my opinion. Like this guy goes out to a rural heavy wooded area and picks up this guy who just murdered two men. It's like if he had said one wrong thing, there was a chance Ben could have murdered him too. I just wonder what the car ride was like. You know, like was Ben awkward and fidgety or was he just like held his composure. Anyway, the cab driver dropped Ben back off in Grant's Pass, close to Justine's house. Police went around to neighbors asking if they had seen Ben or a man matching his description, and a lot of them did, even adding on the fact that he had a small white dog with him, which matches up with what the cab driver said. So there's no doubt that Ben had been there, but where is he now? Police continued searching and found someone with surveillance footage of Ben walking around the neighborhood close to Justine's house. They round up the troops and get everyone outside of Justine's, knowing that he has to be in there somewhere. Shooters were posted up like all corners of her house so he could not escape again and run away. They sit there for hours waiting for him to come out, even gassing the place. They end up having to get a search warrant, thinking Ben is just refusing to come out on his own. After receiving a search warrant, they send in a SWAT team, canines, and even drones just to see where he can be hiding. They get nothing though, and losing hope and wondering if he had just continued running, they're about about to call it all off until they do a secondary search outside the house. They find a small crawl space entryway and the canine signals that there's something down there and they find him. They end up throwing a pepper ball into the crawl space. And if you don't know what that is, it's basically like tear gas in the fact that it's an irritant but some people say that it's much worse, almost like a pepper spray bomb. He didn't budge though, so they sent in a robot that's able to show them what he had going on down there. He had bags and clothes, and finally the robot spots Ben, lying under there crouched with a pistol in his hand. They try negotiating with him with the speaker that the robot has, but Ben's not having any of that and does not say a word. What they do hear though is the sound of the pistol going off. The robot goes to see where Ben is and finds him laying down with an apparent gunshot wound. I want to say that he either shot in his mouth and like up or just the back of his throat because when they send in someone to retrieve his body, the officer says 
Jesus Christ, that fucking sound, which was like, oh my gosh, so crazy to think about. And I hope that he gets therapy because damn, hearing someone like gurgling like that probably really does fuck you up. Justine is still in the hospital through all of this with her life hanging by a thread. She did finally wake up, which was such a miracle considering how badly she was beaten. If she had gone home sooner though, who knows what would have happened. I truly think that Ben was waiting for her so he could finish the job. As for the night of the attack, just Justine remembers getting home, going inside, and sitting down on the couch when all of a sudden Ben came in the garage door and started beating her. He held her hostage for three whole days, just beating her and torturing her. It's amazing how much Angie truly cared to rush over. If she had never been found, she probably would have died soon after Ben left. I'm just so glad she made it and she is such a strong person. And if you or anyone you know is struggling with a relationship like this or maybe not as bad, I truly ask you to go get help or talk to somebody because nobody deserves this. But yeah, that brings us to the end of the video. Thank you so much for watching. I will hopefully see you in the next one if you stayed this long. Like the video if you feel up to it. And um, if you want to subscribe, you can, you can do that too. So, but I hope you have a great day. And if you want me to talk about anything, just leave it in the comments below. Also, I'm sorry about the lighting. I feel like I've been in 10 different spots in every video that I've posted. Um, but yeah, so I hope you have a great day and I will talk to you later. Bye. 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 Bye.